Hello, I'm Bob Kaczynski. Coming to you on an autumn day, not unlike that autumn day, October 31st, 1968. A Halloween that left a very significant mark on Buffalo, New York radio broadcast history. It was that night that AM giant WKBW Radio broadcast its own adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, in itself a tribute to the famous broadcast done some 30 years prior by Orson Welles. The broadcast began at 11 p.m. and was interrupted by this announcement some 13 minutes later. reported that a large meteor has smashed into the ground along the East River Road on Grand Island, setting off a series of fires. Several lives have been lost. KB Total News Director Don Lancer on the way to the scene. It was that frightening bulletin interrupting the song Hey Jude by the Beatles that let KB radio listeners know they were in for a very special evening. I'm standing at the intersection of East River Road and Whitehaven on Grand Island, New York. The site selected for the crash landing of a Martian cylinder one that would produce a Martian war machine, one of many that would decimate all of western New York. Now all of this was the brainchild of KB engineer director Dan Kriegler and produced and written by WKBW program director Jeff Kay. We decided to do the War of the Worlds because it was the 30th anniversary of the Mercury Theater's War of the Worlds uh, as adapted by Orson Welles. Well, the original broadcast was no longer available in its entirety. Uh, it was available on an LP, but a lot of the suspenseful moments had been taken out, so we discarded that. And we thought, well, let's, let's do it uh, ourselves, and we'll use the original script. The original script was copyrighted and therefore protected, and CBS wouldn't give us permission to use that. So I rewrote the script to upgrade the language from the late 30s to the late 60s. And uh, in doing so, we found out one very important thing, one, that our newsmen couldn't act. And we were using most of our newsmen in the broadcast. Uh, so, we decided to do something else. I changed the locality from a small town in southern New Jersey to Grand Island, New York, and to have some impact on the local area. And then we decided that I would write the script in such a way that the newsmen would be told, here is where you start, this is where you enter the scene, this is what we want to have happen, during the time that you're on the air, and this is where I want you to end. That was one of the major uh, advantages because uh, it was being broadcast as a news coverage of a real event, a fictional event, of course, but being broadcast as if it were real. So that using real newsmen uh, was quite appropriate. Now, if the real newsmen had to read lines, as we attempted to do at uh, first, uh, it was completely impossible and inappropriate. But when real newsmen were allowed to do real newsmen stuff, make up their own lines, you told them what the story was, uh, the details of the particular scene, and they, we all did like a bunch of children just said, let's pretend is it, that it is real, and they reported it as if it was real, and so it sounded that it was real. I was the mobile man at the time, so I was uh, very comfortable. I was sitting in the, in the cruiser, in the radio news cruiser, parked right outside on the driveway of the, of the station. And I was very much at home. I had covered some on-the-scene events, so this thing just kind of fell right into place, and it was quite easy for me to do it. Redoing a radio War of the Worlds broadcast, I mean, what was your initial reaction? I was excited about it because even at that time, as long ago as 1968, I was old enough to remember the original War of the Worlds, the Mercury Radio Theater War of the Worlds with Orson Welles, uh, which in itself was a recreation of the original H.G. Wells uh, story. So I thought it was a great idea to take the War of the Worlds story and localize it with familiar locales and um, and Strangely enough, it had, on a smaller scale, because obviously you're talking about the Niagara frontier as opposed to New York City, where the Wells uh, radio show originated uh, and played uh, nationally, uh, you had a very similar reaction uh, to that show. Uh, for those who are not acquainted with the story, it basically involves uh, the invasion of this planet by a, a Martian force. And uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was really frightening, uh, almost as frightening as this interview, Bob. Um, 
<laughs> in any case, the newsmen were asked to ad-lib their way through this program with the basic script. Well, it was remarkably real, and it worked just beautifully. Uh, we pulled a news cruiser in the back of the radio station next to the production studio door and used the two-way microphone in the news cruiser to transmit the script that the guys were doing and uh, the effects, the, the, the news button cutting on and off, the microphone button cutting on and off, were really dramatic. There were lots and lots of little touches like that that added to the realism of the show, plus the fact that the newsmen, now that I think of it in retrospect, used their own names, which added a great deal of believability to it. My God, John, there's something growing out of the top of this thing. It's way down by something. I can't say what it is. This thing is rising up. I've got to get out of here. I, I can see it now. I, I can see it, too. It's, oh, my God. This is 393, Jim. Just what is going on out there? So we had the show recorded in that fashion and into the can. Everyone in the radio station participated. Jim Fagan, Henry Brock, uh, Joe Downey, and, uh, of course, all of the the uh, regular air personalities, the Jack Armstrong, Danny Neverth, I believe Stan Roberts was involved as well, uh, Sandy Beach, a number of others. He had at the top of the hour a scheduled five minute newscast and that was the official uh, real newscast of that time period for that day, except for the very last story. The last story was a fictional story about astronomers observing something strange on Mars, which is the kickoff point for the whole story. But that was real and live. Then we went to the regularly scheduled uh, uh, disc jockey, which was Sandy Beach. And he had lived beautifully, um, made sort of fun of the story uh, until it became more and more serious as supposedly real news about the events started coming in. So the whole thing uh, went together uh, virtually seamlessly. But that was done simply on the talent of the disc jockey, done live on the air. That was not part of the tape. And you actually added certain sound effects as the broadcast was aired. Right. Now, this, of course, took place a long time ago when the equipment wasn't the good equipment that we have today, the almost flawless audio equipment that we have today. So that to make a, a, a tape recording of something and then to use that tape recording and add to it always deteriorates the sound. So you do as little of it as is necessary. Well, we wound up uh, at a point where I could actually add some of the sound effects and uh, some of the background uh, of music, as I remember it, it's been a long time, uh, live on the air. And that was done uh, out of hubris and the idea that we would save a, a generation of copying uh, to do it. The preparation for the show, uh, prior to airing it, the last thing that we wanted to do was to create any kind of excitement in the city uh, or panic or, or hysteria or any concern. So in all of our announcements on the air, we said very deliberately what it was we were going to do and where it was going to happen. It was going to happen in Grand Island. It was going to happen in Buffalo. It was going to happen in Niagara Falls. And we covered the whole area. We also, the day, uh, in the days prior to the show, we mailed three separate letters in the eight surrounding counties to fire and civil defense, police and sheriff's departments, hospitals, newspapers, radio, television stations. And the day of the broadcast, J. Don Schlott, who was the writer for the, then the Buffalo Evening News, uh, gave us his entire radio television column and said specifically what it was we were going to do. And the poor folks on Grand Island where the Martians landed, we went over to those people, alerted them as to what was going to happen on that particular street. I, I believe we bought them pizza. I'm not sure, but in any case, uh, everyone we thought was alerted. 11 o'clock, Halloween night, and the show goes on the air. And the sequence of events, we followed exactly as Orson Welles had laid them out. It's almost to the second, the exact sequence of events. As the show progresses, from a music show to a news break-in, to more music, to another news break-in, and then time begins to compress, and things begin to happen in a very rapid way. Uh, the emergency begins to take on more and more significance. Uh, more and more people are drawn into it. KB's extensive promotional campaign did not prepare the masses for what Jeff K. and Dan Kriegler unleashed over the 50,000-watt signal. Now, you must remember that 
we had interrupted the show a number of times with commercials. We were advertising monster shoes for AMAs and uh, other clients of WKBW radios. Nobody listened to those commercials. Nobody heard them. People didn't tune up and down the dial to find out if other stations were carrying this. Almost all of the 11 o'clock news shows were off the air. By the time the show begins to really build, it was past 11.30. Now the phone at the radio station began to ring. That's true. It jammed the telephone company. Uh, actually jammed the exchange. Uh, we had uh, people, police chiefs calling in, off-duty policemen to repel the invasion. We had newspapers sending reporters and photographers to Grand Island. They got halfway there before they realized that, no, this couldn't possibly be. They never admitted that they went. However, our spies saw them. They actually did go. Uh, Jeffy, uh, the, the re reaction while it was on the air was quite intense. And we had been doing disclaimers for a long time. It was quite clearly established it was going to be a recreation and a fiction. But the reaction was so uh, astounding in its intensity while we were on the air that Jeff felt that he had to get in live on the air and give uh, a disclaimer. I began to answer the phone and people were hysterical on the telephone. And I became very concerned because this was not what we wanted to do. I went to Kriegler in the control room and Danny was very busy mixing in these sound effects and I said to him, Danny, I've got to go on the air and we've got to do a very, very big disclaimer to take enough time to call people to their senses because some of these people believe what we're doing. Kriegler said, no, <laughs> absolutely not. You cannot go on the air, I won't permit it. No. I said, Danny, we've got to do it. He said, I'll fight you first. And it was going to come down to an actual fist fight for me to get on the air uh, because it was really, the show was driving and it was just building. So I went to the tape rack where the big tape was on the wall and it was turning and was broadcasting out and Kriegler was over to my other side of the room and I said to him Danny if you don't let me go on the air I'm gonna rip this tape right out of this machine and run like hell onto Main Street with it and we'll never finish it and he said okay you can go on the air so I went on at the next commercial break and I pleaded with people. I said, ladies and gentlemen, this is a play. This is a drama. This is not happening. It's a figment of our imagination. Please, you know, don't believe what you're hearing. It's not happening. Everybody is safe and secure. That was totally useless. It did nothing. It is a case where we were both right. Uh, he was right. It was good. The situation was getting out of hand. And I was right that, yes, uh, it would detract from this carefully scheduled uh, compaction of time to make the war work. Uh, in the event, it was unnecessary because uh, in another 10, 15 minutes, it was perfectly clear that the thing was unreal. Uh, we had uh, people literally come to the control room door in tears, beating on the door. Uh, in panic over the thing was real. The, the credibility of people who only half hear something is astounding. It's not that, uh, that they're particularly gullible, it's just that they have less information than they need and people tend to take all broadcast facilities as being quite, uh, quite true. The verisimilitude uh, of, of broadcasting is uh, ingrained amongst the people, and if they get only half the information they need, uh, then they assume that anything they hear is true in total. We were, they, were calling, uh, they were calling home that night, and, and I just couldn't believe it. I thought there was a, I thought they had promoted enough the fact that we were going to, uh, you know, they were going to do this broadcast, and I thought all of the law enforcement agencies in the area had been alerted to the extent that there would be no problem with it. And, uh, but I know, again, when they, the show was repeated a few years later, they took great pains again to alert the public, and still there were calls. Well, some of the death scenes, particularly Jim Fagan dying on Grand Island when the Martians were shooting out laser rays, were, were a little difficult to get because the guys just didn't want to die. Did you, did you wish, had you wished that you'd stayed longer into the... Oh, yeah. They wrote you a longer part? Yeah, I, I always said, I always kidded Jeff about the fact I think you nipped my acting career right in the bud. I mean, I, I went early. I, first, I thought it was his wishful thinking because I always said I was a thorn in Jeff's side. 
But then uh, someone reminded me a little later that I think they let me go early that night because I had to go home and babysit or something. <laughs> the broadcast indeed affected listeners in a manner few could have foreseen. Like the Orson Welles version some 30 years prior, people ignored the disclaimers and commercials and accepted in their hearts what their minds said could not be true. The Buffalo Police and Telephone Company reported over 4,000 calls were taken the night of the broadcast. Canadian military authorities actually dispatched troops to the Peace Bridge, Rainbow and Queenston Bridges to repel the Martian invaders. One local small town police agency began to break out the weapons until they themselves heard a disclaimer. A local county civil defense agency went on alert, and the UPI actually printed wire stories during the broadcast up and down the eastern seaboard reporting on the so-called Martian invasion in Buffalo. As you now know, legendary Buffalo newsman Irv Weinstein played a significant role in the broadcast. He himself meeting his demise on top City Hall, a victim of the Martians' dreaded death ray. Yeah, that was it for me. Uh, I was in mid-sentence when I was suddenly cut off shortly after I, I asked uh, Jeff Kay to call my wife. <laughs> I don't know, tell her I wouldn't be home for dinner and <laughs> things were okay. Near the end, when uh, Irv and uh, Jeff had to take it down and, and uh, end the show, I thought that was a, a very well-played, very dramatic finish to uh, what had been a very exciting time on the air that night. I'm not sure whether Irv Ab lived his death or whether... Uh, I had written it in the script, not certain, but it was a telling moment. Jeff, it, 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 it's extremely difficult to describe this thing. It's, it's like nothing I've ever seen. You better get out of there as quickly as you can. That's all right. I'll be all right. I, I just want to say, Jeff, it's, Jeff, it's turning my way. Er. Uh, this must have been right up your alley, because not only did you get a chance to do some radio drama, but you reacted as yourself as opposed to playing right. a player. Well, I, uh, as you know, started in this business uh, as a radio actor uh, when I was a kid. Uh, I had a part-time job at a local radio station in Rochester. Uh, and so it was right up my alley, and uh, I loved the idea. And all of the people involved in the show, uh, news personnel, who had no experience acting, whatever, really got into the mood. Um, and I think uh, really did an incredible, an incredible job. Um, the bottom line is that uh, despite the fact that we made announcements throughout the show that this is a radio show, this is not really happening, uh, when we, during the show, indicated that um, aircraft, uh, unidentified flying objects, had landed on Grand Island and little people were running out and there were flashing <laughs> lights and things like that. Our phone lines lit up and people were really frightened and in point of fact uh, there were people who packed up their cars and they were they were taken off uh, for the hills. Did you sit back moments after it was completed and did you realize what you had just accomplished? I mean, that this thing would stand us up on its own for years to come? I had an inkling, of, but no real realization. And the inkling came, I don't know whether this is absolutely accurate, but I do believe that we, that was the first radio program that became a, uh, an, a wire service story while it was still on the air. While we were on the air, the program had not yet finished, the Associated Press Wire carried a story of the, of the upset it was causing in Buffalo. That was before the program had actually finished on the air. So I don't know of any other case where a program has actually become a national wilds, uh, wire story while it was still on the air. And I would have to think the fact that you aired it on Halloween night, that you got much satisfaction on the fact that you scared the hell out of most of Buffalo. The, oddly enough, we never intended to scare anyone. That wasn't our idea. Our idea was uh, to play, to let's pretend to do drama like the original was. And I'm quite sure that Orson Welles never really, uh, he, he's always denied it, and I believe him, that he ever intended to cause any trouble or scare anyone. He wanted to do a well-done, dramatic thing on a Halloween-ish, or fantasy theme, and that is exactly what we wanted to do. But I did, uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, I did choose a method and mode of direction of doing it uh, that was literally a lie. Since none of it was true, 
I wanted it all to seem true, and that was a conscious decision. But when you're assuming that no one would really believe Martians are coming, you take that as a given, uh, you're always very surprised when a great number of people didn't take it as a given. The, uh, the island sunk and Buffalo was destroyed and I died in the streets choking on gas from the Martians. The uh, interesting effect about that, dying in the street on Main Street in Buffalo in front of the, the old tabernacle and Channel 7 television station, was that we were never out there. There was an interesting way to do that just by taking the microphone in the studio and bringing it right up close to your face and breathing heavily into it. <sighs> and that gave the effect, the ambient sound of being outdoors. Just one of the small effects that we did to help create the realism of the thing. Well, after I died, I went back to my office and I sat there and reflected for a moment and I said, I'm literally dead in this market. I'll never work in Buffalo again. I typed out a resignation, put it into an envelope, slipped it under the studio door or under the general manager's door. And I answered one last phone call. And it was a man who said that he was the sales, the regional sales manager for one of the major three automotive manufacturers. And he called me every name in the book. The invective was absolutely astounding. And he said that he was canceling all of his advertising on the station and would never, ever, ever buy time on WKBW radio again. We were not to call on him. We were not to even cross the street to greet him. So I thought, well, now I've not only cost the station its license because of the Federal Communications Commission, but I've also cost it money. I'm surely, I'm dead now. I'm out of work entirely. The next morning I came in to clean out my desk. I was hoping that it wouldn't come to that, but I was prepared to do that. I came in to clean out my desk and I talked with Warren Potash, who was a sales manager. And Warren said that he'd gotten a strange call from a guy who was the division sales manager for a large automotive manufacturing company. And they had placed all of their business on the station. And I related the story and I said, well, gee, he called last night. He called me all kinds of names and said he canceled. He said, well, he wasn't listening to the right radio station. He thought he was listening to WBEN. He canceled all the business over there and brought it over here. And as it turned out, I wasn't fired. But it was a remarkable night. And it certainly is a Halloween that I'll never, ever, ever forget. The day after it aired, it was, um, it was the talk of the town. It was the talk of the town. And uh, in, uh, in the case of the radio station, uh, we got a number of complaints, to be perfectly honest, from police agencies uh, and some private individuals saying that we had scared the hell out of people. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, we had proof on the show that uh, we made several announcements that this is just a radio show and don't be frightened, just continue to sit in your Morris chair and, and enjoy the show. Um, but, uh, but I thought it was a, it was a nifty idea and it, it worked out very well. And even today, when you listen to the show, uh, you have a sense of um, what the mood was like uh, and the mood that we created uh, in that show. Uh, it was an excellent program. Even today, uh, when you hear the tape, uh, it is an excellent program. It was uh, quite well done. Uh, in the sense of being well planned and it was beautifully performed by uh, people who uh, their enthusiasm uh, turned them into actors of considerable quality. Uh, for the task at hand it was very well done. Uh, the program itself is perhaps one of the last gas of radio as entertainment. Uh, television is now the premier entertainment medium Radio is taking on other functions now. You do not have radio networks, uh, except in, the, in Canada, where uh, the distances involved uh, uh, require a radio network to provide basic entertainment to a, a large number of people. Uh, radio itself has changed its nature. Radio as a medium has changed its nature. And this program is one of the last original, truly radio things that was done. 
There are, there are others, of course, uh, but uh, due to its size and the, and the effect that it had, at least locally, in fact, not only locally, we had heard, and it's true, I'm sure, that in Bangor, Maine, the police chief had issued an order to call in extra patrolmen halfway through the program. It didn't take him long to change his mind as the program uh, uh, proceeded. There are wire stories. Jeffy Kay had, or had uh, certainly a f full file on all sorts of things from quite uh, far away. After all, KB was a 50 kilowatt station, and as soon as the sun went down, it covered the whole eastern United States. So from distant places, uh, we got similar effects. Uh, in an attenuated form, the same thing that had happened to the network uh, on the original Orson Welles show. I've done a lot of theater and I've done a lot of acting uh, in my time, and that does stand out as a very special kind of moment. It, um, it was fun, and it was even a little scary because we did really get into character. Would you call this the greatest Halloween event ever in Buffalo's history? Well, I suppose by accident that may very well be true. Uh, it was meant to be a Halloween event in that it took place on Halloween and it was appropriate to Halloween. Uh, we did it because uh, Halloween gave us an excuse to do a really good uh, dramatic production. Uh, it was never intended to be scary, really. It was merely intended to be appropriate to the season. The effect that it had, the genuine fear that it aroused in uh, an astonishing number of people, uh, was unanticipated. It really was, and quite surprising. But it's probably true that uh, more by accident than design, it, uh, it was, well, as we'll say, one of the liveliest Halloweens in living memory. Lights are all going out. That's not quite how the broadcast ended. Veteran morning man Dan Neverth closed with the explanation that the Martian war machines would stand frozen on the horizon, much like the tower behind me, they themselves falling victim to the common germ. So you see, the Martians won the battle, but not the war. As far as the broadcast, it went on to influence many generations of Buffalo radio listeners. I myself, finding that particular October 31st, 1968, as a seminal moment in my choice of broadcasting as a vocation. So as Halloween rolls along, look to the skies. You never know who's watching, nor who's listening.